I am Paul Bowman, I'm Professor of Cultural Studies at Cardiff University and it's a great honour to be asked to give this lecture at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, today my topic is Bruce Lee Action Techniques and Anthropotechnics or what Bruce Lee Choreography can teach us about reality. So um, the half century long debate about how good a fighter Bruce Lee really was may seem both passé to aficionados and intellectually irrelevant to everyone else. However, within the debris of the debate about Bruce Lee's real fighting abilities in relation to his on-screen performances and pedagogical persona, there remain some important insights into cultural issues related to such well-worn themes as the relationships between fiction and representation and reality, acting and doing, being and appearing, as well as questions of embodiment, skill, affect, translation across media, and as flagged by my title, the rather grand sounding word anthropotechnics. This is the word that philosopher Peter Sloterdijk uses to theorize human discipline, in a word, training. So my title poses the question of the relationship between fictional dramatic action techniques on the one hand, and anthropotechnics, or real physical lived training, and skillment and ability on the other. Our case study is the question of the relationship between filmed fight choreography and so-called real fighting in the world and work of the late, great Bruce Lee, someone who was by turns a great martial arts actor, innovator, teacher, and perhaps also fighter. Of course, this last claim remains a moot point, one that is still debated 50 years after his death, which is of course why I've selected it here. If we leave the question of Lee's innovations and teaching abilities to one side for a moment, we can begin with the binary that people often draw between his acting abilities and his fighting abilities. We might think of all of these realms as separate or separable. Someone could excel at one, but suck at the other. However, they both share something in common, something that is expressed by the term performance. Now, performance is an interesting term. It sounds straightforward and is easily used and used correctly in everyday language. One performs something, it is a performance. But even in such everyday usage, performance can mean mutually contradictory things, often at the same time. It's inherently ambivalent or unstable, and hence is a potentially deconstructive word. For when I perform something, I may be either really doing it, or merely acting it, or both, sometimes neither. I can be both doing it and acting it, and not really doing it, as when a teacher demonstrates a technique, and as when students attempt to mimic, replicate and perform it, or as when Bruce Lee performs apparently plausible techniques on screen. Of course, the fields, the academic fields of acting and performance studies, not to mention theatre, film and media studies, have known and shown for many years the putative boundaries between supposedly real and supposedly unreal are not only unclear or unstable, they are deeply flawed and problematic and essentially kind of hysterical. They're hysterical in the sense of being both laughable and yet also indicative of a kind of neurotic response to some trauma. In this case, that would be the disturbing realization of the impossibility of the ontological viability of these categories themselves and the reflex desire to cover this over and bury this impossibility, insist on them as real. There's not time here, and to be honest, I don't really want to rake through any scholarly discourse on ontology and epistemology. Nonetheless, I do want to interrogate the place, work and usefulness of the concept of reality as it exists in and around the discourse of Bruce Lee's performance of combat techniques. To recall, this discourse is structured by the question of the relationship between Bruce Lee's on-screen performance and his real fighting ability. And I've already proposed that the notion of performance gets in the way and complicates matters from the outset. What I want to emphasize here from the beginning may seem obvious to students of philosophy or cultural theory, 
especially those steeped in post-structuralism or postmodern theory, but it may be less obvious to others. This is the instability and untenability of many common sense and supposedly obvious concepts of the real, notions of the real, beliefs about reality or feelings about what reality is. These are often naive or crude senses that rely on rough and rarely articulated binaries and syllogisms. In these, reality is equated with something like unmediated materiality, states of nature, the built environment, the Umwelt, or more generally, the outside. In many discourses, from those of political activism, to studies of consumer behaviour, to the discourse of self-defence, all of this coalesces into one superlative image, the much-invoked street. The street is the image of reality. A long time ago, when I was writing about political activism, I coined the term street fetishism for this but it's best not to do an image search for street fetishism um, because you definitely won't see political imagery. But to return to my point, the street is the figure of reality. The evocation of the street is the invocation of the image of reality. This is because the man on the street, men on the street, the gang in the street and so on, these are the figures of real physical and existential threat. The flip side of this is unreality. To follow the same logic, if reality is the physical material of the outside, whether that take the form of nature, stone and rock, or the built form of brick, metal and concrete, then unreality is a product of the inside. At one extreme of the inside we have imagination, fantasy and representation. At the other extreme, things like choreography, performance, act, show, deception. In such schemas, Bruce Lee's action choreographies must be essentially unreal because they are spectacular performances, acts, shows. Worse, they are fake representations of fake situations. Such binary oppositions are what Jacques Derrida termed metaphysical. His term, the metaphysics of presence, identifies what he regards as a central structure of Western thought or belief the belief in the absolute priority of living, material, face-to-face -face presence in the present. Everything else is less real because less present. The fact that such binaries are fragile doesn't change the fact that, like film zombies and action movie anti-heroes, they are extremely hard to kill. They are very good at one thing, returning. Translated into the discourse of martial arts, combat and self-defense, the ground, a concrete wall, a street, an aggressive attacker, these are all real. On the other hand, tatami, mads, 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 mats, pads, protective equipment, teachers, rules, drills, rituals, belts, rankings, collaborative training partners, these are somewhat less than real, or different to the real, of the life and death encounter in the street. At best, they are softenings of the real padded approximations of abstracted elements. If not simply unreal, these might be deemed, in metaphysical common sense, to be dangerous supplements. Not because they're really dangerous, but because they pull one away from the real and into fictional worlds. The ability to view martial arts, clubs or styles in this way is one of the reasons why it's incredibly common for practitioners of one style to regard other styles as unreal or is less than completely real or realistic. To regard the training or style of one or another martial art as less or other than real is to deem the human practitioners of that style to be the very embodiments of a fictive representation. Grapplers may regard high kickers as living in the dream world, punchers may regard grapplers as blind to the bigger picture, and vice versa, and so on and so on and so on. You know all of this. The flip side, however, for those who practice martial arts, is that the dojo class or club does not have the status of a soft play area, but rather that of a scientific laboratory. It's not a dangerous supplement, it's a necessary supplement. Certainly, we do not think of scientific laboratories as places of pointless and ineffectual, unreal simulation, but rather as places of experimenting with the real, of working out ways to intervene and alter 
real forces, processes, situations and problems. Martial artists may implicitly or explicitly regard their own training halls as laboratories. Martial artists of other styles may regard other clubs as factories. Factories turning out crap. McDojo's providing paying customers with happy meals. Products that relate to reality in much the same way that a McBurger relates to actual food. Thus, the binary returns. Such products are held to be not real, but unreal. As I said, the binaries that define the metaphysics of presence are tenacious. They eternally return. Bruce Lee straddles this binary like a colossus. On the one hand, his celluloid choreographies, his fabulous fight scenes, are clearly unreal representations. But on the other hand, as has been acknowledged by myriad fans, viewers, commentators, martial artists and other athletes, something in them seems real, really real. The source, of, the source of that effect, or rather that affect, seems to relate at once to something in the embodied, end-skilled physicality of Bruce Lee, the practitioner or performer, and also to the ways in which that was captured cinematically. Put differently, the reason Bruce Lee's fictional choreography seems to contain something real seems to relate to the fact that he was a brilliant action actor and that this brilliance was captured well on film. But how do we dig deeper into notions like unskilled physicality or brilliance or such a thing being captured well on film in order to make their implied meanings less enigmatic? Multiple academic fields can offer terminologies and ways to broach such subjects. However, rather than rushing into academic terminology, I want to first consider the status and usefulness of certain everyday formulations. To start with the most well-known, we might say, for instance, that Bruce Lee was able to sell his techniques well. He could sell a punch, he could sell a kick, and sell the taking of a hit, with a kind of compelling, albeit magical, realism but can we be more precise than that, still without using academic terms? Perhaps. In an article on learning Chinese martial arts, Timothy Nolte proposes a distinction between gong and fa, in which fa refers to the outward form, the rules and principles of execution, the techniques, and gong refers to the effective combative energy, power or effectivity. The implication is that one might learn the outward form of a style, one might learn to go through the motions, but be unable to put gong in the techniques or application, i.e. the correct power in the correct place, the correct time in techniques. Nolte argues that the distinction between gong, skill, and fa, technique, is ubiquitous in Chinese martial arts. He connects these, what we might call emic, or practitioner terms to Maurice Merleau-Ponty's etic or academic notion of embodied intentionality in order to examine them. Of course, the very term embodied intentionality might plausibly be translated almost directly back into the Chinese martial term for intent or intentionality, yi, which itself can sometimes be taken as a cognate or alternative form for gong. And perhaps all of this could be related back to Bruce Lee's lesson for his student Lao at the start of Enter the Dragon, namely his injunction, we need emotional content. In these terms then, Bruce Lee would be a practitioner whose performances either demonstrate, capture, communicate or convey gong in techniques. His performances don't simply depict fa or technical correctness. In fact, sometimes they don't. Rather, they seem to communicate gong or power, perfectly timed and perfectly directed. If this all sounds too abstract or hagiographic, let's clarify via a counter-example. The music video for the song Knights of Cydonia by the rock band Muse. I discussed this video in my 2021 book, The Invention of Martial Arts. I love it. And I return to it because it captures so well the badness of so many representations of martial arts combat. The genius of the choreography in the Knights of Cydonia video is that all of the techniques are ever so slightly wrong. 
in just about every possible way. The timing is wrong. The balance or movement of weight is wrong. The postures are wrong. The interaction with combatants is wrong. Everything is ever so slightly wrong. But it is wrong in exactly the ways that all bad choreographies are wrong. From failed fight scenes in film and television programmes to failed fight scenes in dojos and gyms. <laughs> to failed fight scenes on the streets. All the actors sell the punches, kicks and throws, but we don't buy any of it. And this is clearly deliberate. The video brilliantly captures the badness of bad choreography. One thing the video clarifies is that without elementary physiological correctness, no technique can look right. I can show you two slow motion versions of a hoop punch, for example. One that involves the raising of my elbow, the bending of my knees, the bracing of my head, the movement of my weight, and the twisting of my foot, and so on. And uh, another that just involves the arcing motion of my arm in isolation. And you will know immediately which one has the potential to be the better punch. This first relates to far or physiological mechanical correctness. But importantly, only one version has the potential for gong, the technically correct version. But gong is not manifest yet. Gong would only be manifest in the actual, effective and efficient power conveying delivery of a technique. Two quick examples might illustrate this. First, an example about athletes and Bruce Lee's acting. Second, an example from a Jackie Chan documentary. So, athletes first. More than one boxer and martial artist has stated that they learned how to put total body power into their punches by watching Bruce Lee on screen. Bruce Lee captured and conveyed the energy and effort of putting power into techniques. The question of whether he was acting or enacting could become a mise en beam here. But really, it's a trompe l'oeil. This is because the notion of performance encompasses both acting and enacting. In Nietzsche's formulation, there is no actor behind the action, there's only the action. Or as Lee put it, it hits all by itself, because the word I does not exist. To use the term popularised by Judith Butler, all there really is, is performativity. In this context, this implies that acting and enacting are essentially the same thing, anthropotechnic matters of mimesis. To learn how to enact a punch, I must first learn how to act a punch. To learn how to put power into a punch, I must first imagine putting power into a punch. Some people, such as Bruce Lee, can then go on to perfect acting, putting power into a punch. This is not to say that the acted punch is not an enacted punch. It's rather that the acted punch, that in the acted punch, the power is not ultimately directed at the target, even while it also potentially is. Rather, it's ultimately directed to the camera, for the viewer. Lee famously and confusingly called this acting unacting or unacting acting. The punch is real, but the real point of contact is the camera, not the literal physical target. Second example. There's a scene in an old documentary about Jackie Chan in which a former martial arts competitor turned actor is trying to interact with Chan and execute the sequence of moves in a fight scene. The former competitor struggles to carry out the choreography correctly. This is because he keeps closing the gap between himself and his opponent, Jackie Chan. In moving in on his opponent and closing the gap, he's technically fighting well, advancing aggressively and putting pressure on at all times. However, for the sake of the camera or viewer, what is needed is that the fighters maintain a stable distance between each other so that that back and forth of the techniques can remain visible as crisp and precise and clear and so that it can be captured by the camera and represented as, or as if, high skill level combat. Adherence to this stable distance back and forth convention is probably why I was never really a fan of Jackie Chan, which is not to say I didn't like Jackie Chan films. This is because it might be expressed as boiling down to a privileging of far or technical precision in execution over gong, power in techniques. <laughs>
Bruce Lee, on the other hand, rarely demonstrated a wide range of so-called authentic techniques of Chinese martial arts. Many of his on-screen stances and poses, and especially the poses he would strike on photo shoots, were simply made up, invented and posed because they looked good. Many of his photo shoot poses are simple self orientalization with no mimetic connection to authentic Chinese martial arts at all. Similarly, many of the techniques he executes on, street, on screen are not easily connected to any specific Chinese martial art either. Nonetheless, even when these movement images occur purely for their spectacular value, one might say that they still have a kind of far, a technical plausibility and an affect, affective gong, or the capture and communication of a clear feeling of power. But here we must be clear, this communication of gong is a translation. It's what Ray Chow might call a cultural translation, the movement from one medium into another. In this case, a translation of gong from the haptic interpersonal realm of embodied physical co-presence into the medium of cinematic visual and audio capture. Ray Chow's theory of cultural translation is not the only theory available, nor is it the first or last word on the subject. Chow was heavily inspired by Walter Benjamin's theory of translation, for, for instance. What she takes from Benjamin is that translation always involves some form of transformation. To translate in terms of prioritising a selected signified or meaning, a meaning, for instance, will inevitably come at a cost to the original signifier or the sensuousness of the sounds of the original words. On the other hand, to, main, to maintain fidelity to the sensuousness, grain, texture, aesthetics or materiality of the source language will extract a cost in terms of fidelity to possible signifieds or meanings. In other words, Translating or communicating across contexts, however defined, involves choices, inventions and costs, or a necessary infidelity to the quest for one or another kind of fidelity. To my mind, and stated simply, Bruce Lee's cinematic choreography chose to try to capture and communicate the gong of the power of explosive techniques. Now, of course, any supposed sharp distinction between the cinematic realm of fake representations and the real physical realm of true embodied actions is hampered by the existence of documentary recording, audio, video and still photography of that which really happens, whether spontaneously or otherwise really, in the real world. There are also deliberately staged representations that are enacted with pedagogical or documentary intent and so on. Reciprocally, or viewed from the other direction, aficionados will also be aware that Bruce Lee was always very keen to insert arguments about real fighting into his fictional and dramatic TV and film appearances, whenever possible. In Longstreet, for example, Lee has his character give lectures on the principles of Jeet Kune Do. In Way of the Dragon, Lee has Tang Lung beat Chuck Norris's cult by liberating himself from the strictures of classical combat approaches. In End of the Dragon, as we've already seen, Li lectures Lao on the primacy of the proper psychological and emotional attitude needed to sublimate Fa into Gong. And by all accounts, Game of Death was to be an extended parable on the values of transcending the strictures of limited and limiting styles. Nonetheless, According to Dan Inosanto, his longtime friend and student, Lee himself would often evoke a distinction between flashy cinematic techniques for entertainment and simple and direct techniques for effective combat use. As Inosanto saw it, for Bruce Lee there was, so to speak, street Jeet Kune Do and screen or cinematic Jeet Kune Do. Cinematic Jeet Kune Do was bigger, flashier, more spectacular. Street Jeet Kune Do was straighter, tighter, more linear. The question is whether this is borne out by the available documentary or documented evidence. 
The increasing transfer of celluloid archive first onto the DVD extras and then on the platforms such as YouTube over the last few decades has made much more footage available to considerably more people. As a result, more commentators have had the opportunity to analyse Bruce Lee's technique, both in his films and in footage of him training, giving demonstrations or training others. Interestingly, many such analyses zone in one, on one single technique. This is a technique that, along with his nunchaku use and his signature vocalisations, is almost synonymous with Bruce Lee himself. This is the sidekick. The force of Bruce Lee's semiotic association with the sidekick is strong. Arguably, he effectively changed its status. For although the sidekick has demonstrably existed for centuries and been applied in diverse contexts in different ways across cultures, it was arguably Bruce Lee's execution of it on screen that elevated it to such a new aesthetic status, in which it arguably came metonymically to stand for Asian martial arts to call. That is, despite the sidekick's well-documented existence in, for example, historical European martial arts or French savate, Bruce Lee made the sidekick his own, made it stand for him, him for it, and both became the very symbolic encapsulation of Asian martial arts. So let's have a quick look at Lee's sidekick. Lots of other people already have, in books and magazines, and most recently in YouTube analysis videos. Such analyses examine one or more repository or genre of archival footage, whether uh, final cut film fight footage, outtakes, home video footage, or footage of demonstrations, and so on. In the interest of brevity, I will make some sweeping statements about the conclusions drawn by most of the Bruce Lee breakdown analysis films I have seen. I've seen probably too many. So, first, the broad consensus out there is that Bruce Lee's sidekicks, as seen in his films, are powerful kicks delivered with significant force. The most famous sidekick may be the one he delivers to O'Hara in Enter the Dragon. The critic's view is that this is a real kick. Second, the sidekicks we see in his home video footage are also powerful. Third, the kicks we see Lee deliver in such contexts as his Long Beach sparring demonstrations in the 1960s, while being okay in and of themselves, are surrounded by some less than perfect movements and less than perfect techniques, which, as one interpreter puts it, suggests that at that time, Bruce Lee and his students did not seem to have done very much sparring and certainly not by today's standards, even if they were responsible for raising the bar by putting the need for extra sparring out there. The question is what this might tell us about Bruce Lee's real fighting abilities. The answer at this point is very little, perhaps, other than that if he landed a sidekick on you, he could make a mess of you. But does this translate or equate into fighting ability? A good builder or joiner might be incredibly powerful and accurate with a hammer, but this does not mean that they are Thor, god of war. The truth is, we need to look directly at the elephant in the room, the notion of real fighting. It's actually hugely problematic and contains all manner of untenable assumptions and false universals. Most obviously, when people evoke or invoke real fighting, they tend to be thinking of something akin to a formal duel. But this is not in any way a universal or even particularly common real form of interpersonal violence. To elevate the myth of the fair fight or duel to the status of exemplar is a kind of romanticization and hypostatization, aka essentialism, of fighting one that owes as much to familiarity with literary, theatrical and cinematic conventions as it does to sporting institutions such as boxing. However, when people evoke real fighting, many more qualifications and clarifications are required. Where? When? Why? With whom? How many? With what objectives? Under what conditions? 
Under what legal system? What social and cultural institutions supervene? What's the anthropotechnic environment? And so on. In other words, the question of real fighting is like any other question of the real, namely mired in uninterrogated generalizations and preconceptions, and based on a cultural fantasy scenario elevated to the status of norm, ideal, or yardstick. What I've said, what I've just said, will seem painfully obvious to many self-defense researchers and teachers. However, it's also painfully obvious that many martial artists either remain ignorant of or choose to ignore such matters. Thus, we return to the real unreal binary, or the question of whether the gym is a lab or a soft play area. And I don't want to get pulled back into this black hole or cul-de-sac. I'd rather go somewhere less obvious, but perhaps more informative, and look at the evidence and ask about medium specific matters of technical performance or the performance of technique across different media contexts. That is, I want to examine the way a technique is translated from medium to medium, context to context. There are of course many possible ways to divide up the space-time continuum in order to specify and delimit a technique. For now, let's just use conventional terms and boundaries and equate technique to conventional units such as this or that kind of kick, punch, strike, lock, hold or throw, etc. Obviously, we might also want to define micro-movements, subtle interactions, feints, deceptions and other elements of interactions with opponents, the camera or the environment, as specific techniques to be isolated and exampled later. But for now, let us start with the psychic, and let us consider how it's executed or depicted across media. In terms of the stark schema of real versus unreal, we can ask, is Bruce Lee's sidekick a flashy, spectacular cinematic technique, or is it one of Street Jeet Kune Do's preferred efficient, simple and direct techniques? It's certainly flashy. A sidekick is not a natural move. It requires training, anthropotechnic skill acquisition. Nonetheless, across all recorded contexts, Lee gives prime position to the sidekick. He does so cinematically in those huge jumping sidekicks and skip and step in sidekicks and so on. He also does so in television, in the Jeet Kune Do episode of Longstreet, for example, and he does so in many home training videos. This is because the sidekick is a kick that needs to be trained. You don't train it, you can't do it. Interestingly, he also centralises it in ostensibly practical or pedagogical publications. The front cover and the entirety of the first chapter of his posthumously published book, Bruce Lee's Fighting Method, Self-Defence Techniques, for instance, is saturated with sidekicks. On the front cover, Lee sidekicks an opponent up into the air. On the contents page, he sidekicks an attacker on the street, squarely in the chest. On the next page, he sidekicks another in the leg. On the next, he sidekicks to the front of the knee. On the next, he sidekicks to the back of the knee. On the next, he sidekicks to a groin. On the next, the chest, and so on. So, it sidekicks on the cover, the contents page, and through the entire first chapter. If this is not elevating the sidekick to primacy, I don't know what is. Of course, this book was published posthumously, so Bruce Lee cannot be held personally responsible for its final design. But the very existence of these photographs suggests that Lee regarded the sidekick, even the high sidekick, to be not just a flashy cinematic display, but also an entirely valid, perhaps even primary, self-defense technique to be used in real fighting on the street. Thus, the sidekick is both one of the most spectacular cinematic techniques, fast, explosive, devastating, beautiful, sublime even, and also one of Bruce Lee's favorite practical techniques, adhering to all of the principles of efficiency and efficacy that he advocated as a martial artist. It is also a fairly clear example of anthropotechnics. For the sidekick to come easy, to seem natural, especially if it is to become a reflex response to a surprise attack. This requires training, 
lots and lots of training. Training in how to execute the movement and training in how to execute it automatically or pre-reflexively as a rapid response to a fluid situation. The question is, what does this teach us about reality? Was Lee's cinematic choreography informed and infused with his street level pragmatism? Or was his pragmatic and practical thinking and innovation in and around martial arts unwittingly mortgaged to cinematic performance? But differently, when we see Bruce Lee kicking the heavy bag outside his home, we know he's training. But what's he training for? The street or the screen? Or is he indeed in his classroom training for the lesson? The most we can say is that he's training for performance. An insight attributed to Miyamoto, Miyamoto Musashi is that you can only fight the way you train. That training becomes you. Our training is always infused and organised by a theory of practice, whether explicit or tacit, whether we know it or not. This is why there is no fixed ontological stability to either the form or content of combat. Street combat can easily be informed by the cinematic Cinematic combat can easily be informed by the street, not to mention uh, any of the other contingent contexts of life. The human is environmental, ethological, biosemiotic, and always invented. As Lee famously said, humans have at most two hands and two feet. This led him to ask rhetorically, how many ways of fighting can there really be? His belief was that ultimately such small and equally shared numbers of limbs and digits should tend towards universality, that styles were limitations, ossifications and strictures. What he'd not finished thinking through were the full implications of the fact that you can only fight the way you train, and that there are unknown and unknowable numbers of ways to train. Furthermore, the way you train both informs and is informed by the way you think. And the way you think is saturated and saturating, full of dissolved representations, imaginations, theorizations, and images and lessons from one's surroundings, from the cinematic to the poetic. We pick up from what surrounds us, just like water. However, unlike water, we do so in unpredictable ways. The norm may be two hands and two feet, yes, but each of my hands is different to its other, as are yours. So that's an awful lot of very different hands and feet, each in different places, informed by different ideas, beliefs, ideologies, ethics, each trained differently. This is why, for Sloterdijk, there are as many umwelts or environments as there are living organisms, and why there must be a shattering of any monological metaphysics which explains the world as monocontext and projects it onto a single eye. This, for Sloterdijk, must be replaced with a pluralistic ontology which introduces so many worlds without having recourse to the hypostasis of an eye of all eyes. This line of thought can take us both to some predictable and to some unpredictable places. One tedious place is tired old talk of relativism, a term that has very limited value for any theoretical or practical purpose I can think of other than policing established senses of the proper. Rather than go back there again, I would prefer, like Deleuze and Guattari perhaps, to focus on the interactive character of Umwelt, or rather on the fact that it includes a dialogue between parts of entities and thus presupposes a movement of opening up pre-established entities. I like this phrase, a dialogue between parts of entities. Might this be a fruitful and worthwhile image? Might it help us to escape from naive misapprehensions of the supposed relationships between representation and reality? I might see Bruce Lee's dramatic cinematic sidekicks. I might devote my life and all my training to this technique. And I might use it wherever I like. And when I do, it will always have the status of Schrodinger's sidekick, undecidably present and absent, double and spectral, real and unreal, fantasy and pragmatic, and more at the same time. In fact, might the phrase, a dialogue between parts of entities, 
also offer a new definition of Jeet Kune Do. I'm thinking of Lee in Longstreet throwing a kick to the knee and lecturing, I see your approach and I intercept it. A dialogue between movements expressed as a strike to the knee. Indeed, might a dialogue between parts of entities also express the sentiment in Enter the Dragon that the highest technique is to have no technique, to reach the point where Gong or Yi sublimates far, to have no technique because the word I does not exist, only emotional content in a dialogue between parts of entities. To my mind, and in conclusion, this is at least part of what is interesting and important about part of the relationships between Bruce Lee's action techniques and anthropotechnics, and at least part of what Bruce Lee's choreography can teach us about reality.